Good morning and welcome. Bright sunshine day. Grateful that you're all here to worship our Lord and Savior. We have a time of fellowship after the service, so please join us for a time of fellowship, coffee and goodies. For those of you that are joining on the internet, we welcome you. Special shout out to Liz Holthouse. She's been joining us so um, on the internet. So Liz, you're here in spirit. We love you, girl. Announcement time. There are some happenings going on this week in the church. We have um, gems this week. Gems will meet on Wednesday. And um, men's Bible study meeting on Thursday at 7 o'clock in the fellowship hall. Any other announcements for this week? I know Pastor Terrence has one. Um, in the bulletin, um, boy, maybe I shouldn't make this announcement now. The balcony hasn't filled up yet. Probably another five minutes, I suppose. Um, but in the bulletin, you'll notice, uh, I'm sure you noticed this, in the inside, there's a section called Pray For. Um, I, I remember as a child, this is the section that I always read as a kid. <laughs> I would find out what's, what's going on, you know, who's in the hospital, whatnot. Um, I just want to say a, co- a couple things about this. Um, this is where we put the people in our congregation that we're, that we're praying for. And it's always tricky uh, to know who to put in, how long to put people in. Um, Some people will say, hey, take me out. Uh, They don't want to be in there very long. Other people will say, hey, keep me in. Um, The challenge that is a challenge. So in the office, we have basically, we've just kind of set some policies in place to help us figure out what to do. And our basic policy is to put people in for two weeks. Okay, um, we'll put somebody in for two weeks. If there's an ongoing thing, we'll, we'll put them in again a little bit later. But unless you are communicating with us um, that you want someone in for uh, a longer period of time, we don't know. Um, and just because we're not putting people in there doesn't mean we're not thinking of them either. Um, Alice and I are both very okay with being imperfect. Um, we're very okay with being flawed people. <laughs> you will not hurt our feelings by saying, hey, um, why isn't so-and-so in here? But you have to communicate it to us, otherwise you won't think of it. And again, I can't emphasize this enough, just because someone's not in there doesn't mean we're not thinking of them. Um, just because someone's not mentioned every Sunday in the congregational prayer doesn't mean we're not thinking of them. Um, there are a lot of things, a lot of people that we have to cover, and so we have to be strategic about it. Otherwise, you'd be sitting for two hours, and then I'd also get complaints. <laughs> and by the way, if, you, if you're bothered by the length of service, come and talk to me. I'll probably be able to tell you why it was extra long. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, just, I, uh, this is my philosophy with, with life. It is always best to talk to the person directly. I, I, this, is, this is the best thing for relationships. It's the best thing for community. Um, talking to somebody else, complaining to somebody else is not an effective way to build community. It actually destroys community. So I'm really big on this. Um, talk to me directly. You don't even have to go through Allison. You can go directly to me if you want something in the bulletin because she actually goes to me um, about that. So just a couple of things again. Talk to me directly. I, I will not be hurt. Um, if I turn red, it's because I'm embarrassed or maybe I, I'm caught off guard a little bit. But it does not bother me. Please talk to me directly. Um, and that is all I have to say. I'm looking through the bulletin, and it says that we still ha- um, need things for the Hope Center. So the grocery cart is back there, Norma. There's quite a few things in the grocery cart now, and I've got some money, so I'll go tomorrow and probably deliver the bags tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, so we're wrapping up the Hope Center. Um, Any other announcements? All right. Please stand and prepare our hearts for worship. All who thirst, come to the water. Come, all who are weary.
come all who yearn for forgiveness. The Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, is with us. And our gracious and holy God claims us as his own. Drink deeply from the well of living water. Join us as we sing, I will sing of the mercies. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. I will sing. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness through all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. The God who claims us in baptism in baptism says, you are mine. He is the one who greets us this morning and greets us with these words. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with you all now and always. Amen. And as God has greeted you, those of you who belong to him, please take a few moments and greet, greet the others around you. seated. Friends, water cleanses, water purifies, water refreshes, water sustains. Jesus Christ is the living water through baptism, Christ calls us to a new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of the world and to live a new and holy life. Yet when we fall into sin, we do not despair 
of God's mercy or continue to sin. For baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. Trusting the promises of our God in our baptism, let us together ask God for his forgiveness, confessing our sins together. Please bow your heads. God of grace, in the wrong we have done and in the good we have not done, we have sinned without knowing it. We have sinned willfully and we have sinned in weakness. We are sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and renew our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news, people of God. Through the prophet Ezekiel, God speaks a word of grace to us. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. You will be my people, and I will be your God. People of God, know and trust that in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and you are loved. Thanks be to God. Join us in singing. time I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's message. See if we have how many we have. Morning, guys. What's this? It's called a tripod. Do you know why it's called a tripod? Because it's what? Because it's a triangle? Huh. I guess that's part of it. Um, what does tri mean? Tri stands for three, and there are three legs. Isn't that cool? And I don't know about the pod thing. So I'm, I'm going to put my, uh, my drawing board on there. It is not upside down. You can, it's uh, it's multi-directional. This is, it's, uh, it's sideways. It's sideways, yeah. Hey, do you guys know what? I actually, I didn't know this until I came to church, but it's St. Patty's Day. Do you know that? Is that why you're wearing green? Is it? I, I wore green because I like green, and then I found out it's St. Patty's Day. Um, do you guys know who, who uh, St. Patrick is? Does anyone know the story of St. Patrick? No? Jesus? No. Jesus was just Jesus. Um, St. Patrick was a missionary. Do you know that? He brought, he brought the gospel to um, the Irish. Do you know that? What's that? What's that? No, today we celebrate him. Because, and he was a missionary. He went to, the, to Ireland. He was actually a prisoner there. He escaped, and then he decided to go back and bring the gospel. And he spent the rest of his life bringing the gospel to the people of Ireland. So that's, that's St. Patrick's Day. All right, guys, I want to, I'm going to draw a picture for you. Hey, this morning we are reading a story, and it's a story about the Israelites who crossed the Red Sea. Have any of you heard of that story before? No. No? Maybe? It's a, good, it's a pretty good story. Maybe you go home today. Um, and you can ask your parents to read it to you, okay? And in this story, 
God tells his people, he says, or actually Moses tells the people, he says, your Lord will fight for you, and you just have to stand still. Okay? So it says the Lord, so God will fight for you. You just have to stand still. What does that mean? Do you have to fight? No. Who's doing the fighting? The Lord. God. Jesus. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to draw you this, this picture. Um, this is uh, art at its finest. Oh, it'll be clear in a minute. No laughing. I'll draw a belt. See, this is how much attention. I'll give the person a belt buckle. How about? Hey. You guys laugh, but this is, this is taking me a lot of years to. Uh, okay. And then boots. Oh, we'll just do shoes. I, don't really, I, really, I, I can never figure out how to do the shoes. I, I understand the problem. It's kind of like elf feet, don't they? Does anyone ever stand like this? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but that's, that's, how, that's how I draw, okay, some buttons. Oh, they need hands. We'll just do a bunch of fingers. Kind of look like webs, but that's all right. Okay, and this person has a smile. Okay, this is you. I'll give you hair. Or maybe this is me. This is how I can have hair. Okay. Smile. Oh, we need eyebrows and hair on the forehead, too. All right. It, it is. It's a boy. Well, you are all boys, so it works this morning, doesn't it? All right. Now, guys, when we are born, we know that we are sinners, all right? And what that means is that from the time we're born, we sin. Um, our hearts are broken is another way of thinking about it. Um, so what, I mean, there are lots of examples we give of sin, right? Can you guys think of some examples, maybe that, that, of sins that you guys commit or ones that I do? Can you think of any examples? Yeah. Yelling. Yelling. Screaming. Screaming. And, and what we all say to our kids, it's okay to scream if a stranger is taking you, but um, screaming at your sibling because they won't give you a toy, not okay. I'd say yelling is the same. Hey, can you think of another example? Yeah. Arguing. <clears throat> what about hitting? Does anyone use these to hit people? You've never done that? Weston, you are an angel. Yeah, you must be. I wonder what Charlie has to say. You're not an angel. You're right, you're not an angels are angels. People are people, aren't they? Um, punching. Kicking. Kicking. Oh, with these. These uh, big boots that I gave, you can do some serious damage to somebody. Okay, any? Yeah, um, any other sins maybe? I have a list here. I should maybe look at it. Go ahead, guys. Pushing. Pushing. Okay, any other examples? Saying something mean. All right, I think we've done pretty well. So when, when we do these things, right... What do we deserve? Some punishment. punishment. Yes, I'm glad you're good. <laughs> punishment, right? We deserve punishment. Um, if someone robs a bank, what should happen to them? Punishment. Okay, but what? They should probably go to jail, right? Yeah, there's see the jail cell. Your mom and dad put you in the corner. It's kind of like jail, isn't it? Yeah, so when we do bad things, we should, we should be punished. Um, do you guys know what the punishment is for sin against God? It, it's more severe than, than the things you guys have, than we've talked about. Does anyone know? Yeah. Go ahead. It is, it's death, yeah. The, um, because we have sinned, we actually deserve death. That's, that's, that sound, doesn't that sound a little bit much? It sounds a little bit more... Uh, more serious than, than, um, than really. I mean, just because I punched my brother, I don't deserve to die, right? But what God says, these sins are not just against the people we hurt, they're against him. And they're us saying, God, we don't need you. And the punishment for that is, is, is death. Now, guys, there is a story that I know you guys know where Jesus fought for us. 
You remember how he said what the God said to the Israelites or what Moses said? He said, who, who would fight for them? Who did he say would fight for them? He said, the Lord, God, right? And what did they have to do? Nothing, right? They just had to stand still. There's another story where the exact same thing happens. Do you guys recognize that? Yeah. Who, who, was, who was there on the cross? Jesus. Was I on the cross? Were you on the cross? No, none of us were. It was Jesus. And you know who he was fighting? Jesus. He was fighting the death. The thing that we deserve, he beat death up. Wouldn't that be fun to watch? Someone beat death up? He crushed him. He destroyed death. And what did we have to do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, and, And him doing that, this is what happened, guys. All of these things, right? All of them were taken care of. And most importantly, guys, the punishment was gone now. He was punished for us. Can you guys imagine if in your house you did something wrong and your mom, instead of sending you to your room, went to the room for you? That would be a little weird, wouldn't it? Can you imagine you just hit your sibling and your mom says, I am, you know, you're in trouble, the punishment is you have to go to your room, but I am going to go for you. Has your mom ever done that? No. No, wouldn't it be weird? That's exactly what Jesus did. He said, I'm going to take your punishment for you. He saved us, yeah. Because if we would have died, that would have been it. No more living. We'd be gone forever. I, yeah, I did erase his boot a little bit. I ripped it? Oh. Let's, let's say a prayer, guys. And there's children's worship, so you can go down for children's worship right after this, okay? All right, let's pray. Jesus, you fought for us, and you beat death up. You crushed death. Um, you, you did that so that we would not have to die. You took our punishment for us, and we're so grateful for that. And as we get older and older, help us to always remember this, that you saved us by grace. It wasn't us. We didn't save ourselves. We did not even have to help you save us. You did all of the work, and we just had to stand still. Help us to remember this always. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys. You can take a candy, and there are suckers on top, but then there are some other things on the bottom, okay? Take one, and then you can go downstairs. You can dig a little bit if you want to. Before a congregational prayer, I just have a couple of things I want to share with you. Um, basically, I, uh, I'm looking for your uh, prayers, my wife and I. Um, we, uh, many of you know we visited a church in Essex, Ontario, which is about two and a half hours north of here, um, a month ago maybe. Um, anyway, uh, they, they voted and have extended a call, and a call basically means... Um, we have three weeks to decide what to do, um, so just covet your prayers. Um, I'm always, is there are things that I, I want to say sometimes, and my wife would tell me, don't say things like this, but I'm going to say because she's not here. Um, if you want us to go, please don't, you don't have to say, don't lie, say we want you to stay. Just say, you know, we'll pray for you. <laughs> it's, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, 
please just uh, ask for your prayers and, and so on um, for us. And then in two weeks, on the 31st, we actually um, have been asked to go to Edmonton, Alberta, um, to visit a church there. So, yeah, we're in a season of um, discernment, uh, of uh, seeking God's leading, and just ask for your, your prayers. As, and, and the ultimate vision is that together we're seeking God's, um, His desired future for all of us. Um, right? The church is more broad than just the individual congregations. Um, so yeah, just ask for your for your prayers and understanding um, as we as we go through uh, through this particular um, period in our lives. Um, with that, please join with me in our congregational prayer. Father, last week. Um, and really throughout Lent, we're thinking about baptism. Um, this, uh, this is a sacrament that you've given us. Um, you did not give it for your sake so that you could be able to distinguish who is yours and who is not. Um, you did it for our sake so we would know, so we would remember. Um, why is it important to remember our baptisms? Because it reminds us that we belong to you, um, that you've called us um, to you, and you've marked us um, as your own. And this is something that we, we need, especially when we go through storms in life, when we go through difficulties. Um, it's important for us to remember that we are, um, uh, that we are yours. Um, this week, as we talk about another building block of faith, um, one of which is to be- know we belong, the next of which is to know that we're saved by grace, that we are part of your story, that we fit in there, um, that as we read this morning in the book of Exodus, that this is our story too. This isn't some remote story of some primitive people. This is our story. Um, help us to see. Help us to believe these things, understand them, and, and know what they mean too. Um, this week, uh, we lament um, the pain and suffering that is in this world. Um, we lament the, the hate that is in this world. Um, we lament um, terrorist attacks and, and different attacks on, on people, um, especially thinking of the New Zealand attack this week um, where 50 people were shot and, and killed. And we think of other attacks like that where uh, maybe in other regions of the world where violence doesn't surprise us, but it does happen, and it's, it's just as bad as where it happens, you know, when it happens in civilized places like New Zealand or, or here too. Um, countries like in, in Egypt and uh, um, in the Philippines and other, in Iran and, and all these countries where violence is so much a part of their, their lives, we, we lose touch that this is still, um, this is still wrong. And so together this morning, we lament the violence that is in this world, the ways in which us humans um, cling to control, try to gain control, and try to protect our interests. Um, we long for the day when this will be all over, when things will be as they're supposed to be. I'm um, grateful this morning, though, for uh, when evil comes knocking, and, and death is evil. It's not your idea, um, but death, as it comes knocking on our lives, as it will for each one of us, um, we're thankful for uh, things like hospice. We're thankful for people who can sit around us as we, we face death. I'm knowing as believers that we do not have to fear because you already crushed it. But still, there are things about it that are scary and daunting. Um, we're grateful for Roger and his, his life, but be with him as he faces the, um, the certainty of death, um, when exactly, we don't know. Um, but be with him and give him the comfort he needs to know that he will be okay as he passes through the, um, the threshold of death and passes over it with you carrying him. Um, we're grateful for treatments like kidney transplants and stuff. We're grateful that um, Scott is able to be on a kidney list. We're looking forward to hearing that a match has been discovered and that he will get that. Um, we think of Ben and Jill as they support their daughter, Samantha. She seeks a, a, a transplant, and Riley um, is offering hers. Um, we think of um, Ken and Robin and their daughter, Katie. Um, and she's had her fair share of struggles. And we pray for Liz this morning, that you'll heal her foot. May she know that even though she's not physically here, she's not forgotten and that she belongs um, in your people. And this morning also, maybe we don't do this enough, but we ask that you bless those who are at sporting events this morning. Um, we ask that you bless them in their interactions with fellow parents, officials, teammates. While we wish these events were not on Sundays, uh, they are. Help us to be wise as we engage with culture so that we can be light and salt wherever we are. 
Even if it's at an event on a Sunday morning when we feel the pressures, maybe even our, it bothers us a little bit inside, I mean, thinking we should be at church. Help us to see that you are sovereign over all these, all these realms, wherever we are. Um, but in the same vein, may we not give up on meeting together as some are in the habit of, of doing. Meeting together is essential for the Christian life. And Father, as we turn to your word this morning, as we hear your story, hear of your sovereignty, of your grace, of your power, um, that you, you show uh, us, um, that you show the Israelites and the Egyptians in our story this morning, you show us. Um, help us understand, help us to see ourselves in this story. And may we be released today more than we have been before um, from our idols and from the things that, that we are bound to. May we experience, not just know about your grace and the freedom you offer, but experience it today more than we have. And may we continue to do so in, as, we, as we continue to grow and mature as believers. In your name we pray, Jesus, for your sake and not our own, for your glory and not our own. Amen. This time, I'd like to ask you to open up your Bibles as I throw things on the floor here. I have this lovely shelf, but it has no back on it, so if I push a little too far, it tips off the back. It's a design, design flaw. Just to make sure I don't tip my cup over, because then Ken and Steve will be upset with me for ruining the electronic things. Um, so this morning, yeah, we're reading uh, chapter 13, starting at verse 17 of, of Exodus, and we'll read all, all the way through the end of Exodus 14. This is a, a long reading, um, but uh, it is what it is. So it's found on page 107 in, the, in your pew Bibles. It'll be on the screen, and as always, please feel free just to listen if that is, um, works better for you. So, start, chapter 13, starting at verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So, God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. So after leaving Sakoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud, pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night." Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi uh, between Migdal and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and, but I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, of Pharaoh king of Egypt so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Piharoth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after him. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians 
than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood between them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He made the wheels of their chariots come off, so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may flow back from over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the great power the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. That's a long story. Um, To really uh, understand this story and to glean from it the message for us, we have to understand the predicament that the people are in and also why they're in the predicament that they are in. Um, They've left Egypt where they've been slaves for roughly 400 years. And while they're ready for battle, God is concerned that if they go into battle against the Philistines, they will lose heart and they will run back to Egypt the place where they are from, that they're comfortable with. So instead, God leads them around the Philistines, even though it is a longer journey, and now they are trapped. What we have to understand about them being trapped here, in this place, they need, right, the whole purpose of this is they need to know, and this is that second building block of faith, they need to know that God will save them. They have to learn to depend on him, right? The first building block is knowing that they belong. We talked about that last week. Um, That's where the covenant was established. They know that they belong to God. And here, they need to know that he is the one who saves them, right? Here, they're trapped. They have no choice other than to trust him. So the reason that they are trapped here, it isn't due to Moses' bad navigation skills, right? Interestingly, he had 40 years of wilderness training since he had left Egypt, Um, quite a while ago, Um, nor is it because the people are dehydrated and they're beginning to hallucinate, which is more along the lines of what Pharaoh suspects, right? God told them to camp near Piharoth and and between Migdal and the sea, and here there's only one access point. There's only one way in because between the terrain and the sea, there's no other way out, and barreling down that one access, access point is the Egyptians. It's Pharaoh and his army. Essentially, right, right, and they're going to overtake them. Essentially, this story of Israel trapped, eventually freed through the Red Sea, this is our story, friends. 
This is our story, just as it is their story. Because we, like the Israelites, need to learn that we really have, at the end of the day, no choice but to trust in God, Yahweh, to save us. At the end of the day, we have no other choice but to trust him. So why does God trap them? I've already hinted at that, but this is how he talks about it. And this is the way we're going to look at it. He says he traps them so he can display his glory. Right? It's ultimately for his glory. He says, I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army by crushing them. Right? It, a number of weeks ago, we looked at the story of G- where Jesus turned water into wine in Cana. And one of the things that it says in that passage is that when he turned the water into wine, he revealed some of his glory. And in that story, right, glory is his victory. It's his sovereignty that he shows over the water. And what he says is this actually points to that moment when I will be on the cross, when all of my glory will be on display. Glory as in victory, triumph. Okay, so that's, those are very similar, see those parallels. But here he says specifically, and it's the same purpose essentially, he says in verse 4, he'll reveal his glory so the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Right? So it's not just his people who need to know, it's the other people too. Verse 18 reiterates this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And secondly, so that the people would fear the Lord. They would see who really is all-powerful, who really it is that they need to trust, and they'll put their trust in him and Moses, the servant who he has sent to save them. Right At the end of the day, the goal is that the people, God's people, will put their faith, their trust in him. So if this story, friends, is our story too, what do the different things in the story represent? Who are the Egyptians? Who are the, Who is the Pharaoh? Who are the Pharaohs in our lives? Essentially, Pharaoh and the Egyptians, these are our idols. These are idols. That is who they represent, right? Because humans, right, humans don't sin just for the sake of of sinning, right? As someone does not wake up one morning and decide, hey, I am going to whisper rumors, spread gossip. Um, we do not wake up and say, you know, I'm going to say all sorts of nasty and untrue things about other people today. Um, we do not wake up and say, I am going to disrespect my parents, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have sex with lots of people today. Um, oh, no, today I am going to stare at pornography for hours. We do not just wake up one day and think, yeah, I am going to sin. That's not how it works. It never has, it never will. We sin because we have idols. Right? We sin as we serve our idols. Right? So what are idols? Idols, friends, are our saviors. Idols are our messiahs. They are the things that we focus on, that we work on, um, that we give ourselves to in order to save us from insignificance, from being unnoticed, from being ignored, from being overlooked, from being forgotten. There are, points, there, and there are points in our lives where it's more easy to, for us to identify our idols. Like the people, all of a sudden, they are no longer in Egypt, and they're in this unfamiliar territory, right? They're trapped, and this is a time where idols are revealed, whether we recognize it or not. It's in these moments. Um, there are all sorts of other moments in our lives, like when we lose a job, um, after a divorce, we lose our spouse, right, to, in a divorce, um, when we lose control of our teenagers, when we lose our independence and move into a nursing home, right? When a disease affects us, we lose control of our bodily functions. These are the kinds of times where it becomes particularly clear what, our, what and who our idols are. It's the thing that we cling on to in that moment. It's the thing that we naturally grab onto to help ourselves survive the angst and the fears that come about with these sorts of changes, and this guy who um, shot 50 people and killed 50 people at the mosque in Christ, uh, Christ, Christ Church in New Zealand, Brenton. And um, why did he do that? Why, why did he decide? Did he wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to go and shoot 50 pe- or kill 50 people and shoot a bunch of others? He does it because of his fears. Him, along with the likes of Dylan Roof, people like that, their fear is the browning of their countries. Their fear is the power that these non-whites seem to be gaining and that the whites are losing. And so for people like Roof and Tarrant, or this Brenton guy, 9-11 and attacks like that, like the attack on the, the church in the Philippines a couple months ago, or like any other attacks on Christians, these serve as things, these are catalysts. 
Right? These are the things that happen. And all of a sudden, there's this void. Okay, now what do I do? And there is this sense, okay, now we need to do something. Now we need to grab onto the idol that we've been holding onto. Right? And what is his idol? What is the idol of people like this guy and Dylan Roof and people like them? Well, you might think it's whiteness or white people. No, it's power. Power is the idol that he clings on to, and he attacks those he perceives to be a threat to his power. Okay, that's how an idol is working in his life. Um, our idols, friends, they always give us hope. They always give us purpose, right? They give us a purpose to something to live for. They give us meaning in life, right? They always give us a, always give, give us a sense of hope, and they always give us a sense of belonging, right? They save us. That's why we cling on to them. Right, and idols are typically good things. It's not a bad thing to have power, right? All humans need a certain measure of power. In the social work world, they talk about empowering people who don't have power. Power is not a bad thing, but when it becomes an ultimate thing, it's a bad thing. And this is true for all idols, right? They're typically good things that we make into ultimate things. And the sin, so where does sin enter the picture? The sin is the things, or the, si the sins are the things that we do to protect our idol and to get from our idol what it offers us. That's where sin enters the picture. Um, I just gave you an example here of, of, for this white nationalist guy, what he does to protect his idol of power. He kills, right? That's the sin. That's what he's doing to protect his idol. Um, we spread gossip. Why do we spread gossip? Because it gives us a sense of belonging to a community, right? Maybe there's a little clique that we feel like we're a part of. It gives us a sense of significance, of security, and right. And what is the what's the power in the world of gossip? It's having that little bit of information that we can share. Um, why do we say nasty and often untrue things about politicians or groups of people that we that we disagree with? Because they threaten our idol. That's why we do it. Right? In terms of politics, it's often there's a perceived, there's an idea or a notion that we perceive others to be against, and so we have to protect it because that's our thing. Um, a great example of that in our country is um, the, the American dream. Right? The American dream is this notion, it's an idea, it's not a bad thing, but when it becomes an ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. And if the American dream is your story, your rags to riches story, or it's a story that you hope to live one day, or at least you hope your grandchildren will live, right? So you've attached yourself to it, your hopes and dreams are attached to it, your identity is attached to it, your significance is attached to it, you will hate anyone who threatens the American dream. Right? That's where some of our hate for, for other people comes in. Um, family can be an idol. Right? Even, I've said this before from this pulpit. Evangelical Christians have made the family, the nuclear family, an idol, which is why single people find themselves on the outskirts of the church. Power. I've already mentioned it, but that is a common idol. Why do you think people complain in church? Right? It's a sense in which we can have some power, some control. And as maybe we lose power, maybe we don't have the same control we once had, maybe we turn more to complaining. Complaining is a great example of us trying to cling to what gives us importance, what gives us value in a particular community. There are so many examples of idols. Physical beauty, church, business, school, sports, career. These are all examples of saviors that we attach ourselves to. I've already touched on this, but I want to drill it down a little bit more. Why are they so important to us? Right? Why are our idols so important to us? Why do we go to such great lengths to protect our idols? Why do we go to such great lengths to prevent others from taking our idols away from us? Because for us human beings, insignificance, being unnoticed, being ignored, being dismissed, being forgotten... This is the death we fear most. Right? In many cases, we fear this more than death. I mean, you can see that with, so if somebody has, if their idol is, is a family, right? They might be a Christian, right? They, they, we think they're Christian, and a fam because family is such a Christian idea, right? We will have no doubt, right? But for a person who's dying and for whom family is their idol, if they're surrounded by their family, they are going to die peacefully, 
Right? It's not because of their faith in Jesus to carry them over the threshold of death. It's because of their family. That's how idols function. When I say right, we fear insignificance more than death itself, that's what I'm talking about. Idols, they give us meaning. They give us purpose in life. Now, the Red Sea, that is this death in the story. See, in Bible times, right, so the Hebrew word for water is yom. And in the Canaanite religion, which was very prominent in that area, and you have to understand that would have influenced the Israelites, Yom was a god. Yom was a very powerful god. They were afraid of the sea. Right? The sea could swallow up anybody at its will. Right? They had no control. They didn't understand the water, the patterns, and so on. In fact, in Canaanite religion, there was a fear. There was this belief that every day as the sun set, the god's son, or the, the god who is the sun, would battle all night with Yom, and the people longed and hoped that the God of the sun would win. And every day the sun would rise, that was a victory. And so they would celebrate. Right? So their lives hinged around this God, this powerful God that is the water. Now, while God's people, Yom was not a God, though they would have been influenced by the culture around them, it represents chaos and disorder, which is what we hear in Genesis 1-2, right? The spirit hovered over the, the void, right? The formless void that was the, what was the water. So water was a terrifying thing. You see, Yom, who is the Red Sea, represents death. It represents becoming nobody. It represents becoming forgotten, isolated, falling into oblivion. Right? What probably the most painful human experience would be to actually die after having been forgotten, right? just being lost, being a nobody, and just dying. Right? That is probably the most tragic story of, a human, of human life. Yom, then, friends, is who we are trying to save ourselves from. Why do we cling to our idols to save ourselves from Yom? Right? Yom is our, or idols are our way of avoiding Yom. Right? Why do you think right? That isolation, that, that in prison, um, conf solitary confinement is so effective, right? Because someone is alone. And why does it also cause so much damage to people? Because they are alone. This is what it means to die as a human being. This dehumanizes us when we are put alone, right? It makes sense if you recall at one point during the creation process, God said it is not good for man. It's not good for a woman to be alone. They need other people. The unfortunate thing is that idols, worshiping idols, while we think we are grabbing onto life, we're actually grabbing onto something that will kill us, that will steal our life. Right? That's the irony of the whole thing. What we as humans think gives us life, gives us significance, gives us, gives us purpose, actually steals our life from us. And we see this in the very beginning. Even though Adam and Eve had each other, right? God made sure they weren't alone. God surrounded them with beauty, right? The garden, he made it very clear to them that they were important, they were significant. And he also gave them a purpose. He said, work the land, work the garden, right? And we call this the cultural mandate. Go and take the earth's raw resources that I've filled this place with and create, continue creating as I have, as I have begun. He gave them all this. But Adam and Eve had this insecurity, and the devil comes in and he taps into it, and this is the fear of being insignificant, of being unimportant. So what does the devil say? He knows this. So he says to them, hey, God's holding out on you. You are more important than you think you are. You are more important than he's letting on. Eat this fruit, and you will be like God. And it works, right? And here again, why do they, right? And the idol here is power and knowledge, right? To be like God. That's the thing that in their minds, that is what is going to give them significance. That is what is going to give them life. And so why do they eat the apple, right? They did not wake up that morning and say, hey, I want to eat the apple to rebel against God. No, they ate the apple because the apple was the avenue to which, for which they could get their idol, right? We sin to get our idol, but in the end, at the end of the day, what happens? They did not give themselves life. They brought death upon themselves. And the whole creation was cursed. The weeds would grow. There would be pain in childbirth. What they thought would give them life actually brought death. And this is true of all idol worship. 
Right? Serving our idols always leads to death. The idol becomes our master and we become its slaves, willing to do anything to please it in order to save ourselves from Yom. And this is why slavery in Egypt is the perfect metaphor for sin and what it does to us. And now understanding this master-slave dynamic, right? it helps us to understand the people's response. Right, they're there, they're trapped, and they see the Egyptians coming in, that one access point. They look up and they see them. What do they do? They cried out because they were terrified. They were terrified. They had failed to serve their idol, right? They had failed to serve their idol, and now their idol was coming to kill them. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the relationship that is there. And they turn on Moses, who happens to be their actual Savior, sent by God and the precursor to Jesus. Right? They, they're confused because they are still slaves to their idol. They don't understand. And they say to him, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? You see, for them, and this is true for us too, Being slaves to Pharaoh and for us, to our idols, being slaves is better than having no control and having to trust God. Because see, with idols, we are in control, or at least we feel like we're in control. We're the ones who, who, who can maneuver, can manipulate the idol to get what we want out of it. And we really like that. We really like having control. So it goes against our grain, this idea to trust someone we can't see and for them who has now trapped them intentionally. Trusting is really, really hard for us. And I think that's why, by the way, Joseph said, take my bones with you. Right? The bones would remind him that God had delivered them. He had delivered Joseph. He had delivered them from Egypt. And he would deliver them again. This is the remembering part, the belonging and remembering part. But like Israel, after being rescued, still trust their former owner more than their new one, we do the very same thing. Right? Have you ever wondered why, as a Christian, you keep on sinning? Does it drive you nuts? Right? You try and you try and you try and you try again to stop and you can't. Does it ever bother you? I know it bothers, bothers me. I mean, I've accepted it because it seems to be true. But why does this happen? It's because we haven't let go of our idols yet. Our fingers haven't been pried from around our idol just yet. While technically we are no longer slaves to our idols, our hearts and minds remain enslaved. This was the issue with the Israelites. Right? It's the life we know. It's the life that we're comfortable with. Um, Tim Keller show, shares a, a good story, a story that illustrates this very well, and I want to share with you. So, so, there's the, so Tim Keller is a minister in New York, a Presbyterian church, and, uh, but he started his life as a Christian in college, in university, and he was a part of the uh, college ministry, and that's how he became a Christian. And so he was a part of this program, and there's this guy um, at the campus who's very sexually active, had lots of, lots of partners, and this guy um, started coming. And he became a Christian. And after he came, after he became a Christian, he stopped doing that stuff. He, he stopped behaving that way. He, he, so outwardly, he looked like a Christian, right? He wasn't doing the sorts of things that he wasn't supposed to be doing anymore. So he looked like a Christian. However, at every Bible study he was a part of, he wreaked havoc. He would dominate every conversation. He was argumentative, and he had to be right every single time. So was sex his idol? Because I bet, like me, your first thought is sex must be his idol. Because, well, we talk about that, don't we? Sex must be his idol. But it wasn't. It was power. Specifically, power over other people. Before becoming a Christian, he saw power over others through his sexual conquests. And now, he did it through evangelism and Bible studies, right? So the issue, the heart, the, the idol that caused him to sin was still there, even though... It looked like it wasn't when you first look at him, right? This was the life he knew. Even though he was a Christian, he still did not trust God, which is why he still needed and craved power over others. Essentially, he didn't trust God to save him from Yom, right? He still needed his power because this is what still gave him meaning and purpose in life. And he feared that if he stopped that, he would fall into oblivion. He would become powerless. So he kept hanging on to power. Why did God lead his people into a trap? That was the question I asked earlier. Why did he lead his people into a trap? 
Well, it's ultimately to reveal his glory and his power, right? The power that delivers his people. Um, It was so that the Egyptians, the idols, the slave masters would know who God is. And friends, he accomplishes this. At the end of the story, there's no doubt who he is, what he is like, and what he's capable of. He moves the pillar of cloud that had been in front of them to their backs between the Egyptians and themselves. That's what he first does. So all throughout the night, they are safe. Trapped, but they are safe. Then he sends a strong east wind to drive back the water to separate. It is said that that path through the Red Sea was roughly a half a mile wide. Because these are a a lot of people that have to travel through there in one night. So it's quite wide. He dries that ground out so that they can travel and not get stuck in the wet sand and mud. And then as the Egyptians begin pursuing them onto the dry seabed from the pillar of fire and cloud, God looks down on them, friends. And this is not just a look like, I see you. This is a look that sends them into confusion. Right? With this look came torrents of rain, lightning, and thunder. The dry seabed becomes soft again, clogging the wheels on the chariots, causing the wheels to fall off, causing the horses to stumble, the people to fall over themselves. And this is so important that we hear this part of the story. What do the Egyptians say? They say, let's go get away. Their Lord is fighting for them. Right? The idol recognizes. The idol knows that they have lost, right? Which is why they cling, why they try so very hard, because they know they're fighting a losing battle. At this point, they have surrendered to the Lord. They know he is more powerful than them. They say the Lord is fighting for them. Let's get out of here. They know who is doing this, that someone is doing it on behalf of the Israelites. Then, of course, Moses stretches out his hands once more, and the water comes crashing on Pharaoh's army, killing all of them. Right? Total victory. Total victory. The Lord God, Yahweh, shows himself to be more powerful than the mighty Pharaoh and his army, to be more powerful than your idols, than my idols. Right? The things we cling to not only lead to death instead of life, but that he does the very thing we hope our idols will give us. Better than our idols can give us. Life, significance, importance, value, purpose. Where idols ultimately cannot do this. It's not lasting, right? If it's power, for this, just this picture of this young man, what if power is his idol, right? As soon as he's impotent, he can no longer go on these sexual escapades. And even though he's now using his power to argue over people, what is going to happen if he loses his voice? What if he loses his mind, right? God is the only one who can give us lasting, permanent significance, value, and purpose. And what did the people, what did they have to say Right? What did the idols have to say? Nothing. And Mo, or what, sorry, I should say, what did the people have to do? Right? This is for us to do nothing. They did nothing. Moses said, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. This is what Jesus did for us on the cross and through his resurrection. There he revealed his glory, his power, his sovereignty. Right? He made a mockery of the enemy of death. He defeated it. He crushed it. Right? And what did we have to do? Nothing. We just had to be still. Right? We are saved, not on our own, by our own works, but by the work that he has already done. Jesus has already proven our idols impotent and barren. He has exposed our idols for who they are, slave masters. And what they do? Bring death, the very thing we're trying to avoid. And why do the Israelites have to travel through Yom now? That's the next question. Why do we have to be sprinkled or be immersed in water? The baptism waters, right? These represent us being buried with Jesus. Why do they have to go through Yom? And I think one possible response will be, well, they need to know that they can survive it, right? To build confidence. Um, That's not it. It's not that they can believe in themselves more. That's not why. It's because the old person the old creation, the you that has loved, that has worshipped your idols needs to die. Right? The people, their dependence, their trust on the Egyptians to provide them life and meaning and purpose 
had to die. That's why they had to travel through the Red Sea. That part of them had to die. That's why we are baptized. That part of us has to die. And friends, this is why suffering is a major part of the Christian life. Right? We're opposed to suffering, and often the Christianity gets mixed in with this notion that we don't have to suffer, but the life of a Christian is a life of suffering, and this is why. Because part of you, the old you, has to die, and that's not fun. That's not easy. Baptism tells us that our idols no longer have control over us other than the control we may allow them to have. The enemy already knows whose we are, and he has no more power over us other than, friends, the power we allow him to have. Right? Just imagine we are like prisoners and the chains have been broken. Right? The, the cuffs have been taken off. We are free to go. Right? The work has already been done for us. We just have to get up and go. That's the position of the Israelites. They've been freed from the Egyptians, but now they have to live this new life out. They need to die to their old dependence, and we do too. That's the prison we still sometimes find ourselves in, this dependence, this commitment to our idols, and we do not have to do that anymore because we already have all the significance, all the purpose, all the value we will ever need in this life. And there's no point in our lives where it's too late to get up and walk out of that prison cell that we are living in. God has opened the doors. God has swept back the waters, giving us dry land to walk through. And friends, walking through those prison doors, those opened prison doors, walking through the Red Sea, this is what it means to fear the Lord and put your trust in Him. To fear Him is to recognize He is more powerful than what we fear in this world. He is more powerful. That's what it means to fear Him. And it's trusting Him. It's entrusting Him with our lives him who has proven himself time and time again to be worthy of our trust. Let's pray. Jesus, while we um, can enjoy the benefits of um, your saving work on the cross, um, in some ways, um, we can still um, live convinced we are Christians and, and, and in fact are, but still live as though we are not. And in many ways, this is the tragedy of the, the Christian church. Um, this is what happens when the Christian church becomes apathetic. It's what happens when the, the Christian church gets too comfortable and the, the Christian church would rather be comfortable than to, than to suffer the death that we all need to die in order to benefit, receive the full benefits of the saving work that you did for us. Father, may each of us this morning be on a journey where we are open and we are recognizing the idols that might be in our lives yet, those old things that we are comfortable working with, the things that we feel like we can manipulate and control to give us some sense of meaning and purpose in life. May we all be in a journey where we're recognizing those things. May we all be in a journey where we're open to you showing us these things because in the end, at the end of the day, we can't really see them on our own. May we be open to other Christians, other believers helping us to see these things. We are not little islands and just in relationship with you. We are a people and you've given us each other to help us see these things. So may we be open. May you take away our pride so we may be able to listen to our friends, our brothers and sisters in Christ in this community and on the other side of the world, sometimes they're the ones who can best see the truth about us. Jesus, you did not intend for us to have a, uh, a life that is, has a little bit of joy. You intended us to have a life that's full of joy, that's overflowing with joy. And may we experience that more and more. May we believe that more and more to be true. And may we uh, long and yearn for that, this life that you have made available to us right here and now. In your name we pray, amen. Our song of response this morning is How Firm a Foundation. Please stand and join us in singing.
may be seated. At this point, we have an opportunity to respond to the good news by um, letting go of our money. One of the things that we use uh, to worship our idols, in fact. Um, this morning, we have an opportunity to, to give those monies to our true king and our true lord. Um, this morning, the first one is for the church budget, and the second one is for Resonate, which is the denomination's uh, world missions um, part, world and whole missions actually together. That's a combined office now, but that's what that's for. This time the deacons will come forward and receive that. Please stand for the closing blessing and song. After the blessing, we'll sing God so loved the world, but before we do that, hear God's parting blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Oh,